welcome to the Saints and Scholars podcast. Today we're delighted to have join us Dr. Michael Hecken. Dr. Michael Hecken is the Professor of Church History and Biblical Spirituality at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and also the Director of the Andrew Fuller Centre for Baptist Studies. He continues to also lecture in Canada and also here in Ireland at the Munster Bible College. He's a strong connection to the island, and we're really grateful for him giving some time uh, today and in the next two episodes also to talk to us about St. Patrick. Dr. Hecken has written this little book, amongst many other uh, bits and pieces of articles and books uh, related to Patrick, but this book in particular, uh, Patrick of Ireland, is one that he's written, published by Christian Focus, to help us try and begin to understand the man. He's married to his wife, Alison, and they have two grown children, Victoria and Nigel. We're so glad he is able to share with us today something of the life of St. Patrick. Dr. Heck, I'm really grateful for you giving us some time to talk to us uh, here on the island of Ireland, and especially to talk to us about uh, St. Patrick. Now, you obviously have written and uh, given a lot of thought to things here in Ireland. Briefly, can you tell us where this interest in Ireland itself came from? What's your connection with the country? Yes, um, I am technically an Irish citizen because my mom is Irish. Um, uh, she was born in uh, Bray, just outside of Dublin. And um, most of my mother's family still live. Uh, I have cousins uh, galore in uh, the Dublin area. Um, my mom uh, moved to Birmingham in the late 40s to work at uh, the chocolate factory there, Cadbury's Chocolate Factory, which is where she met my dad. And so up until our move to Canada, which would have been when I was 12, we would vacation in Ireland every year. So I would, I have memories of taking the boat from Holyhead, uh, the across the Irish Sea to Dunleary, um, and then spending time in Ireland um, during summers. So there was that, you know, very, very strong connection. My dad was uh, born in Iraq and is Kurdish. But uh, when he married my mom, he was raised in a Kurdish Muslim home. But when he married my mom, my grandfather, whose name was Paddy O'Gorman, uh, insisted that my dad become Catholic. And um, so I was raised, uh, and he did, and I was raised in a very, very strong Irish Catholic home. And so culturally, um, although I was an expat, so to speak, living abroad, I, I was very, I was deeply shaped by Irish culture. And um, I, I remember uh, w we had been back, I think only once uh, since the move to Canada. That was after my mom's death in 76. And then the next time I was back was 99. So a considerable period of time. But I remember um, my problem with uh, identifying in terms of Irish culture for, was that for me, after I was converted to be Irish was to be Catholic. And now I was, you know, an evangelical uh, Christian, a Baptist. And, um, but I remember that very vividly um, uh, coming uh, back in 99 to speak at Great Victoria Street uh, through the, the invitation of one of the elders there, Eric Lindsay. And uh, there was just this deep sense of these are my people. I, there were things about my life that I, didn't know how to explain. And that trip back was enormously eye-opening. I suddenly realized why I was the way I was in certain very small areas uh, of my life. Um, and it was d d enormously uh, eye-opening as to the, the, the kind of character that I had, that I had uh, both inherited, but also grown up among. And um, so, um, and that led um, over the next uh, two or three years um, to uh, an involvement with uh, some brothers who had been sending literature, Christian literature to churches in the South, in the Republic. And uh, eventually uh, uh, a strong connections with the Cork Carey project in uh, the South 
and the founding of what we call Munster uh, Bible College um, in Cork. And um, so I, I'm over pretty well every year. Uh, there have been a couple of years that I've not. And obviously this past year with the pandemic was one. When people on the island here think of St. Patrick specifically, uh, we've a tendency to think of lots of myths and stories and snakes and everything else. Uh, what what's some of the more quirky or wild uh, stories about Patrick that you have come across? Well, you have the 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 and there's an entire body of literature that grew up in the early Middle Ages about Saint Patrick. You know the reason why there are no native snakes to Ireland is that uh, I think it's uh, on uh, Slemish he, he 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 climbed up and commanded all the snakes to leave and they all uh, departed. Um, the uh, teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity by the uh, three leaf clover, um, uh, the kind of uh, spectacular showdowns with Druids and Druidic priests, um, uh, the miracles, um, etc. And uh, Patrick is an individual to whom history has in one sense been very generous. Uh, uh, he's known uh, the world over. And um, at the time of the Reformation, uh, in Protestant countries, a host of, of saints days, about a, probably about 140 or so of them were, were dumped, but two have been retained in the Western world at least, uh, St. Patrick's Day and uh, St. Valentine's Day. And so in a sense, Patrick has been, you know, uh, generously remembered, but the remembrance is, 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 is completely false in, in many, many, many ways. Um, and the real Patrick has been hidden between these uh, under these layers of myth. So uh, the, the, there is so many stories told. Is it possible to get beneath the myth then and to try and understand the real man? How do we begin to do that and to work out who the real Patrick actually was? Yeah, if we did not have any written sources from Patrick, it would be very, very difficult. And so a number of the, you know, the saints in that period of, of uh, the Celtic church in Ireland, it's very, very difficult um, to uh, determine uh, exactly who they were, etc., because we don't have any written sources. But thankfully with Patrick, we have two. We have a, a thing, a document called the Confession, which he wrote not long before his death, which is the, the fundamental document for basing his life and ministry on. And then a small uh, text called uh, uh, the letter to the soldiers of Caroticus. And it's not clear whether Caroticus was a Welsh chieftain who was raiding Ireland for uh, slaves or was he an Irish chieftain who was raiding other parts of Ireland. Um, and um, it's Patrick's um, heartfelt anguish at the the capture and enslavement of a number of recently baptized Christians and his um, uh, tear-filled but also uh, threatening divine judgment upon Caroticus if he didn't uh, restore these people uh, to their homes. Well, we're glad, as you said, that those uh, two pieces of writing exist. Dr. Hickman, why don't you uh, just unpack maybe something of the story of Patrick for us? Well, what, what, can, what do we now know about the man? What's his story? Yeah, Patrick was born um, in the latter part of the, the Roman Empire uh, period. Um, he was born probably around 390. And thus his dates stem from around 390 to 460. And um, he's not born in Ireland. So, you know, everybody thinks of a, a Patrick as Irish, but he's not Irish in that sense. Um, he is Irish in the sense that he embraces Ireland as the sphere in which he will live and die and minister. But um, he was born in, and again, is great debate about where exactly was he born. Um, it could have been quite easily Southern Scotland or anywhere along the uh, Eastern uh, Western, sorry, coast of, of uh, England or Wales. Um, he grew up in a situation of wealth. 
Um, he talks about his father having a, a, a villa. Um, he was almost definitely one of the upper class of the British society. And by the word British there, I'm talking in terms of Celtic, um, who had intermingled with the Romans. The Romans had been in Britain at that point since 43 AD, so about 350 years. And um, he grew up speaking Latin, wealth, privileged. And at the age of 16 in 406 was suddenly uh, snatched by Irish pirates. And the larger scene that is going on at the time was the, the military collapse of the Roman presence in Western Europe. And in 406, 407, there had been three legions, Roman legions in Britain, one based at Hadrian's Wall, one based in uh, Eberacum, the city of York, and one based in um, uh, either Chester or Caerleon in um, what is now near uh, Wales, near Cardiff. And those three legions had been withdrawn because the Rhine River, which had formed the barrier to the uh, Roman Empire, uh, physical barrier that the Romans used as the equivalent of like Hadrian's Wall, had froze that year. Um, it had never, ever frozen in Roman memory. And around 200,000 Germanic warriors had crossed various groups, um, Alan, Suevi, Burgundians, Franks, Lombards, Vandals, Goths. And the Roman legions had been pulled out of Britain, the Roman province of Britannia, to defend and throw back these, these invaders. They never returned to Britain. And the Irish, and Ireland at the time had never been conquered by the Romans. It consisted of around 150, and you heard me, 150 small little kingdoms, um, a lot of cattle stealing and fighting among them. Uh, they took the opportunity, and there would have been knowledge of what was happening to some degree within the Roman Empire because of trade and etc. And they took the opportunity to begin to raid and pillage uh, Britannia, so it, what is now England, Wales, or Southern Scotland. And it was in one of these raids that our, uh, Patrick is caught. And he's taken as a captive, probably in Northwest Ireland, probably Donegal, maybe Connemara, um, because he talks about the Western Sea, which is the Atlantic. He was a shepherd, uh, a slave, uh, for the next six years, it would have been deeply traumatic. Um, he would have seen people killed. Um, the Irish probably wouldn't have spoken Latin, which was his native tongue. So he, had, he would have had to learn old Irish, the predecessor to modern Irish. And um, uh, over those six years, he turns to God. He had been raised in a Christian home. Um, he had heard the gospel. He had heard the scriptures preached, but he had paid no attention, he says, to uh, the elders in the church. And uh, in fact, his father was a, a deacon and his grandfather an elder. And um, he is converted. He would have had no scriptures initially. And then at the age of 22, um, he is able to escape. Um, he walks from either Donegal to Connemara to probably roughly where Dublin is today. Dublin is a Viking settlement in, in large part, so it wouldn't have existed uh, then. And he finds a boat back to England or to Britannia. And uh, England is not the, the appropriate term. Um, and uh, would not have returned back to Ireland if it had not been for a number of things. He begins to read the scriptures and is deeply impacted by passages like Matthew 28, 19 to 20, to um, go to the nations and make disciples, and Mark 16, about preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth, and various other passages that reveal God's missionary heart for the world. Uh, he also has a dream in which he, like Paul, seeing the Macedonian at Troas come over and help us, an Irishman comes to him and begs him to return in this dream to Ireland. 
And um, he trains and uh, goes back to Ireland around the year 430 and uh, has a ministry in the northern half of the island. And um, just absolutely remarkable, uh, thousands of conversions, churches planted, training elders. Um, he never goes back to, to his native land, um, has inherited money, and all of his money is spent for the sake of the gospel. Um, a lot of it is having to give small gifts to the Irish chieftains for freedom uh, to preach um, in their lands. And um, archaeological evidence bears out uh, that the earliest Christian churches would have been in the northern half of the island. Um, and uh, within two or three generations, a, an island which had been uh, largely illiterate becomes really the center of literacy in the world after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in Western Europe. There is a book written by a man named Thomas Cahill called How the Irish Saved Civilization. And um, the title is a bit whimsical in one sense, but the book is fabulous because it does really specify how the Irish were able to preserve the riches of the ancient world. But more than that, they, they also had this missionary passion which they inherit from Patrick. And uh, Ireland is responsible for the evangelization of Scotland, uh, Northern England, large parts of the continent, um, and even to some degree, the earliest attempts to reach the Vikings, whom nobody believed could, could, could convert. The, the story, uh, as you've re retold it there, is so compelling. Uh, what in particular do you find so wonderful about Patrick? What, what, what would you want modern Christians to, to learn from this man? I think, and I, you know, we, we, we live in a uh, tremendously unsettling time. You know, we've had uh, the end of the Cold War in uh, the European world. Uh, this was followed by the extensive terrorism um, of uh, Muslims and uh, some homegrown terrorism. And now we have the, the, you know, the challenges of this pandemic, the rise of Trumpism as an ideology, um, et cetera. Um, the turmoil caused by globalization, um, the challenges for Christian proclamation in a world of visual media. Um, the church has, since the Reformation, relied upon the preaching of the word, which is an oral, uh, A-U-R-A-L um, and O-R-A-L. It's, it's we, we, we speak it, we hear it, um, and yet we now very clearly live in a culture that is oriented towards sight. Um, in a sense, we're moving back into a, like a medieval world where the gospel was not preached, but the church claimed it could do it by visual means, which was deeply problematic. And so we have a, we have a host of changes that are very unsettling. And how do we live in a world like this? And I'm very concerned about a number of Christians whose lives have been consumed by politics, by the politics of... Um, uh, of church state relations, by economic issues, etc. And the gospel um, has been eclipsed for these for these Christians. And Patrick, I think, reminds us that in the midst of turmoil, we still have the calling to engage in the Great Commission, uh, to preach the gospel, uh, to plant churches. Um, and uh, Patrick then is, is a shining light. He, he's virtually alone in this period um, in terms of his engagement in mission and evangelism. It's really quite, he really is quite remarkable that the, you, you, you see a, a Pauline figure, an apostolic figure, and I don't think, you know, he's an apostle in that sense uh, as Paul would have been, but he's, he's got this passion to see the Irish one to Christ. And it, it's absolutely tremendous. And I think, I think he stands to us as across the centuries as a beacon of how, uh, how should we live in such a day? 
And um, the, the, the impact of Patrick is absolutely enormous. Dr. Hagen, thank you so much for introducing us to Patrick. For those who've maybe been listening, uh, I've put a, a link in the description of the podcast to uh, one uh, translation of the confession so that you can go and read Patrick's account of his life experience yourself. We will be back next week to unfold a little bit more about Patrick's theology. So please uh, subscribe and join us to hear more about the theology of Patrick. Thank you.